Stem 8 in the sports medicine option covers two dot points. The first one being taping and bandaging, the second one being rehabilitation procedures. Just looking at the first point, taping and bandaging, we need to look at why we would tape or bandage injuries and also how we would go about it specifically in the areas of the ankle, wrist and thumb because they are the areas that the syllabus specifically outlines. So firstly, we're looking at why do we tape and there is three reasons there. To prevent an injury from occurring, to isolate or immobilise a bone or joint injury and also to immediately treat an injury. So looking at the first point, to prevent an injury from occurring, uh, it's been shown that athletes that do tape to prevent injuries have less chance of an injury happening, but also less chance of an old injury reoccurring um, after a period of time. So that's why people actually do strap. Um, and we've just given an example here in rugby league, the ankles and knees are taped, but really you could pick any sport and uh, stay any joint of the body that needs strapping and you can justify that. If a player's got an injured shoulder, they would tape an injured shoulder. And obviously that's done in league, union, AFL, most of the body contact sports. Um, so here's some, just some general advice about the taping if you look at the last two points. Second reason, taping for the isolation of injury. Obviously this is an injury that has already occurred. So what we're trying to do is provide additional support for the joint because the surrounding structures around the joint are not functioning as they should, e.g. ligaments and tendons. They may have been stretched, so therefore the joint doesn't have the stability that once did. So taping tries to compensate for that. Um, due to the combined effects of movement and sweating, though, the athletic tape does lose its rigidity. So you'll often see athletes being re-taped uh, in the middle of a game, uh, and that's because of the, the fact that the taping once an athlete starts moving around and sweating, it loses its adhesiveness, which in turn means it loses its support of the joint. Um, last point there, the location of the joint um, and the range of movement that the joint has will also affect how effective taping can be. If you compare a shoulder joint to an ankle joint, the shoulder has a significantly larger range of motion than the ankle, therefore it's a lot harder to uh, isolate and immobilise the shoulder joint uh, as opposed to the ankle joint. And the last reason for taping or bandaging is to immediately treat an injury. So this would be more along the lines of the bandage side of things and that bandaging relates to the compression part of the rice treatment. Uh, it's also used um, in any bleeding injuries using a sterile pad to restrict the bleeding and stop the bleeding. Um, sometimes strapping is used to immediately treat an injury. That would only be in the case of if the injury happened you know, during a game and the player needed to keep competing till the end of of the game. Uh, strapping tape usually wouldn't be done to treat an injury post-game, post post-performance. You'd be using bandaging in the form of compression bandages and things like that. Now, just looking at the specific sites of the body that we need to tape, first off we've got the ankle here and over the page, I'll just let you look at that for a little bit longer, but over the page we also have uh, the wrist and thumb area. On the STEM8 Moodle site, we also have links to videos on YouTube uh, for these specific areas of the body as outlined in the syllabus. The second dot point is rehabilitation procedures, and this is actually a brand new focus question. So if you see here, how is injury rehabilitation managed? That's the actual question or focus question for this part of the syllabus. And the first dot point is rehabilitation procedures. And you can see here that there's four actual procedures that are going to be used in the rehabilitation process. And you can read the four there. Uh, the syllabus asks you, or it lets you know that you will need to have specific examples of and justifications relating to a hamstring tear and a shoulder dislocation. So what this means is you need to have not only examples of how would someone progressively mobilise a hamstring tear, or how would someone progressively mobilise a shoulder dislocation, but also why are they doing that? What benefits would the athlete get out of actually doing it? So that's the example and the justification. And like I said, you need to have that for all four aspects of this rehabilitation procedures, dot point, for both those two types of injuries. And the fact that's in the syllabus indicates that um, you could get asked a direct question relating to hamstring tears or a direct question relating to, relating to shoulder dislocations. Just looking at the first um, point here, Progressive mobilisation, this is the backbone of all injury rehabilitation. Obviously it makes sense to say you're not going to go from doing absolutely nothing with an injured joint to running at flat out at 100%. So you're going to gradually ease that joint back into uh, movement. 
then it can be done here. You know, you can read that by active and passive exercises. Uh, and once again, I've just made the point at the bottom, you'll need to have specific examples for hamstring tears and shoulder dislocations. The second point is graduated exercise, uh, which involves specifically, as outlined in the syllabus, stretching, conditioning, and total body fitness. So when we're talking stretching, we're talking you progress from static, gentle stretching, maybe then to P and F stretching, then to dynamic stretching. Um, so there's a progression there. So And it does follow the principles of progressive mobilisation. So there's progression from easy, uh, low-impact type stuff to the dynamic stretching, which would be, um, relatively speaking, a lot higher impact and putting a lot more stress on the injured area, which is what you need to do before you get back to play. Um, the conditioning is done gradually, just to return the injured area to pre-injury levels of strength and flexibility. So conditioning um, doesn't necessarily mean fitness, as in uh, aerobic fitness and conditioning. It means conditioning of that injured area. Um, the aerobic fitness and general fitness is the next point, which is the total body fitness. So obviously when a person is injured, you want to maintain as high level of fitness as you can so that when the injured area is healed, you're not as far behind the eight ball as you otherwise might have been. You don't want the principle of reversibility to set in. Uh, and again, just the point, you need to have the specific examples for hamstring tears and shoulder dislocations. Uh, the next little sub point under rehabilitation procedures is training. Just because an athlete has recovered from injury doesn't mean they've returned or they're ready to return to play. They need to do a, an actual training program. Again, you get that term that progressively mobilises the injured part. Um, it involves the athlete in game-like situations. And what I mean by whilst protecting the athlete as much as possible, you want them to be testing the injured area as best they can, but at the same time, still protecting the athlete, so keeping the, the drills as closed as possible so, and controlled as is possible um, before gradually easing back into realistic, specific game-like situations. And again, you don't need me to go over this point on those two parts of the body. The last bit of the dot point is the use of heat and cold. Uh, and obviously, these things are used for different reasons and generally at different times of the rehabilitation process. You can see here when we use cold um, and when we use heat. I've mentioned those there. Uh, and again, it, you need to have the two examples there for hamstring tear and shoulder dislocations. What you also need with use of heat and cold is what it does, like so how you would go about using it. How do you apply cold? Is it you know, there's many different ways you can apply cold. There's many different ways you can apply heat. And also, what it does and why that is good for the injured part. So I'll give you an example with cold, you know, how you go about it. Okay, well, let's say we're putting a, an ice pack on the injured, um, on the hamstring tear. What does that do? So the next bit, what does that do? It just means that this restricts circulation, which restricts swelling, which in turn will restrict the amount of scar tissue that's formed, which in turn will make it easier to return from injury because the less scar tissue there is, the more flexibility the muscle has. The more flexibility the muscle has, the less likely it is to tear. So therefore, uh, that's why that's a good thing in the rehabilitation process. Okay, so you need to know how we put cold on, what are the benefits of the cold, um, and how does that impact on the injury uh, rehabilitation. So again, there you need to have those examples for hamstring tear and shoulder dislocations.